infamous cloud. We're back in the cloud for part two of R622. What is this called? Learning Environment Design. I want to see a silver lining for learning, but that's my podcast show. Everything overlaps in life, you know, uh, but I'm, I'm ecstatic to see my friend Tom Reeves come back to my classes two weeks in a row. Uh, I know he wants to go off to South Carolina or the coast and fishing and reflecting, but, but he's not there yet. So we got him here tonight. And Tom's been studying authentic learning since the early 1990s, if not before that. And he worked with a couple of people named Ron Oliver and Jan Harrington, also Tony Harrington at Edith Cowan University in Western Australia in Perth. And Tom's traveled to Perth as well as other parts of Australia many times and over 30 countries actually he's been to. And he's a prolific scholar. He three, edited three books with me on MOOCs and open education and has, it was a delight working with them on the last one, a MOOCs and Open Ed in the Global South, in the Global South. That came out in 2020. And if you haven't seen it, I'm happy to send it, Tom's chapters or our, well, our joint chapters, if you would like to read what, what we had to say. And that Tom also helped with a special issue of etr &D that we did two years ago. Tom wrote the ending of the, the piece, the closing or capstone of the piece with Dr. Lin Lin, uh, from down in Texas. So Tom, I've known for a long time and I, I, I was always excited to see Tom was on the presentation list because I knew we would not only get a lot of content that made sense, we'd get current information and it would be funny on top. So I'd be learning and laughing at the same time. And there's not many speakers out here which you can say that about. Usually people look at the program and circle the topic and say, oh, I want to go to this. And they get to the room. It's totally boring. They're like, why? The they should have star rankings by them. And so Tom would be our five-star ranking. And others, most others would get two, okay? To be honest, two and a half, maybe we give them. But Tom would be one of the five stars. And I was in Finland when him, David Jonathan, and a, a guy named Richard Stallman were the keynote speakers. And Richard Stallman created the like open education at, at uh, MIT and David Johnson, well known for constructivism and, and so forth. And, and then we have Tom Reese. We, we have these superstars at this conference. And then, uh, you know, where do they take us after that? They take us to a sauna, of course. They think it's jumping in the freezing cold lakes in Finland and whatnot. But anyways, that's 2001 in Finland. I met, I probably met him well before 1999 in Seattle at the Ed Media Conference as well. I can blabber on and on. Abtar was with us at the Ed, Ed, Ed Media Conference in Montreal in 2005. And she met Tom then, or it's not before. Uh, Tom, you want to tell us a little bit about authentic learning and about your work with Jan, tell us about Jan Harrington, about Ron Oliver first, so they can appreciate, because they're going to read Jan's book uh, that's listed for this week, actually. It's a free book you can download, and, um, and, and they might want to get some contextual information about the website she created, about the, her research strand and your involvement, and also your authentic online learning book, if you can maybe do a little um uh, talk about a bit about that they might want to acquire that book for their centers that they work in and whatnot there's so many things that we could touch on maybe i need to shut up and say welcome tom reese let's give him a round of applause and um and thanks for coming in being our five-star person of the week well thank you kurt um can you see my screen yeah okay and you can hear me okay? Oh, yeah. Great. Ha. So yeah, authentic learning is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And as you'll see, I've been engaged in it for literally decades and decades. Um, but uh, this is actually, I'm now living, I taught at the University of Georgia for 39 years. And uh, I retired last autumn and my wife and I moved to a continuing care retirement community on the campus of Barry College. And this is a, a picture of one of the classes here at Barry. <clears throat> They're out uh, sampling the quality of the streams here. So it's an authentic learning task <clears throat> in a science uh, course. 
The um, what Barry College is uh, rated the second most beautiful campus in the country. It's also the largest campus in the country, 27,000 acres, it's huge. And uh, living here, we have access to all of that, uh, hiking, biking, uh, you know, Kurt runs all the time. I think, what day are you on now, Kurt? 914, I think. 914 days in a row. And uh, you would just be in hog heaven here with all the opportunities to exercise and so forth. But uh, my wife's a retired professor emerita of social work, also from the University of Georgia. Here we are with our two Westies in front of our uh, apartment. Uh, we have two West Highland Terriers named Zipper and Button. Zipper's 16 and Button is 13. And uh, when we were getting ready to retire, we just decided that we loved academic life and um, we have so many opportunities here. I'm going to start taking intermediate Spanish on Thursday. Uh, my wife is taking a drawing class here. Uh, I could, can't tell you how many things there are to do. It's just constant. It's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> anyway, this is the a, a part of the campus here. This was uh, are the Ford buildings. They were uh, Martha Berry, who founded the college over a hundred years ago. Uh, got befriended by Henry Ford at some point. He said, how much money you want? <laughs> and so they built a beautiful campus. These dorms are st still used. Uh, on the right there, you see some of the women's dorms. Uh, in the middle is a dining hall, actually. It looks like a church, but it's a dining hall. And uh, it's just exquisite uh, learning environment. And we've got three rivers that come through here and uh, mountains in the distance, uh, just stunning. I'm hoping that uh, Kurt and any of you will come and visit us sometime. So I've actually been involved in <clears throat> authentic learning since 1966. This is a picture of me as a senior in high school. I'm right in the middle and uh, I have a rat in my hand and I'm putting this rat into a three-stage rocket and uh, the local paper did a story about it. Uh, we had we were conducting uh, in the physics class a science experiment. It was called the uh, effects of sudden acceleration and deceleration on rat memory. And uh, we had a experimental rat named Julia and a control rat named Susan. They both had been trained to run a maze. Uh, then we blasted Julia off and. She floated back down on a parachute and uh, then we put both of them in the maze. And what do you think we found? <laughs> we found no significant differences. <laughs> so much educational research finds that. But uh, <clears throat> I um, actually, the, the funny story, the morning that uh, we were going to do this launch. We had the whole student body of Troop County High School out there to watch this. We realized that we had bought the rats too early and they were had grown a lot. We didn't account for growth of the rats. And so we had to carve out extra space in the rocket nose cone for the rat. And probably the study should have been called the um, effects of rat compression on rat memory, but still no significant differences. Funny thing about this picture, most of the boys of this picture were athletes and they just wanted to get in the picture. The four boys who were doing the actual science are the ones with the glasses on. So me and the other three guys with glasses, we were the scientists. All the others just like uh, the tall fella on the left that's holding a rocket. He was a star basketball player. He just wanted to get in the picture. Uh, Charlie Farmer, wonderful guy. Sadly, he was killed in Vietnam not too many years after this picture. Um, anyway, so I've been involved in uh, this type of research for years and years. So my understanding is you read the article that 
Christiane Riley and I wrote. Is that right? Yeah. So what happened is I signed it for week one or two. And then I thought, I need to bring Christiane or you in because people were talking about in the in the, the discussion forum, a lot of discussion in all we have four groups and everyone. And so I said, well, it really belongs in the authentic learning week, which is week six. And then I said, well, no, let's let's move authentic learning to week five. So this is week five. I've moved your article from where it was twice. So it's in there. So they've read it already. So it's, it's a head, they got a head start. So, <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> so Christy Ann and I started working together when she was a PhD student at the University of Minnesota. And it's a long story I won't go into that I became a member of her doctoral committee there. But she's originally from Germany and she's in Germany right now taking care of her very ill sister. So she really wanted to be here tonight, but she couldn't. It's like 2 a.m. in the morning and, uh, where she's in Berlin. Yeah, Tom and I tried, uh, but yeah, we don't want to push her too hard because it's, you know, going to be sensitive. But it's 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 good that we have a chance for Tom to explain it because I, I think, uh, and I read part of her dissertation. She sent that to me last night and I could send that to, if anyone's interested in reading her dissertation, just send me an email, I'll, I'll forward it to you. Tom's, Tom's on the dissertation committee. Um, so it's long, <laughs> it's very good. Yeah, uh, she was the uh, director of the Office of uh, Educational Services at the University of Minnesota when she was doing her PhD. And so she was able to collect a lot of data from a lot of students uh, trying to investigate how can you define and actually reveal whether or not active learning design principles are instantiated in undergraduate courses. And she used design-based research as an approach to do to conduct this study. It's an excellent paper, I think. Um, I was just holding on by my by her coattails. Um, but uh, she based her theoretical framework for her study around a book that I had written back in 2010 with Jan Harrington and Ron Oliver. I started working with Jan when she was a PhD student at Edith Cowan University in Western Australia. And I was asked to come there for five months in 1993. <clears throat> and was Ron Oliver and I were commissioned to study telematics education in Aboriginal uh, cultures. And so we traveled all over Western Australia to visit various uh, Aboriginal settlements where they were using this very crude form of distance education to teach uh, English as a second language. And uh, we also investigated the teaching of Japanese in remote mining towns in Western Australia. We ended up writing a little book about that. And then Jan was uh, <clears throat> asked me to um, help her with her doctoral study which I was happy to do. And she ended up writing a fantastic dissertation about authentic learning. <clears throat> and it won the dissertation of the uh, year from ACT. And I think it was 1999. And then out of that, we went on to write this book, A Guide to Authentic E-Learning, uh, which won the uh, best book award for, uh, I think the design and development division uh, at ACT. Tom, I have two signed copies. Although I should say I had two signed copies. <coughs> I used it in class and lent it out and I don't think I ever got them back. It's so popular. So I'm gonna have to go online and find a used copy. Uh, so I highly recommend this book. Well, I was so happy to work with these folks and they are really still very, very close friends. They're both retired now um, and uh, enjoying life uh, to the fullest. Um, but uh, I continue to keep my hand active in various academic things. I love teaching uh, classes, meeting with folks like you all tonight. Um, and then as her uh, research approach, she used another book uh, that I wrote with Susan McKinney, uh, who I also started working with when she was a graduate student. Uh, and she's now a full professor at the uh, University of Twente in the Netherlands. And the book's in its second edition. 
it's already been translated into Japanese. And as Kurt mentioned earlier, we're hoping that some folks in China will soon translate it into Chinese. <clears throat> um, so um, the going back to the book with Ron Oliver and Jen Harrington, uh, our model has uh, these characteristics of authentic learning. And I wanna illustrate those by way of an example of some work I did with the US Air Force Academy. But uh, you wanna have an authentic context for your uh, tasks that your students are gonna be engaged in. They have to be authentic tasks. You want them to be exposed to expert performances of those tasks. Uh, students will work in teams and play multiple roles and gain multiple perspectives. They'll be engaged in collaborative construction of knowledge, reflection, articulation is the actual sharing of their knowledge, their construction of knowledge. Uh, the teacher's role becomes more of a coach and a scaffolder than a straight didactic professor. And the assessment has to be authentic. So all these things have to be carefully aligned. So let me uh, give an example from undergraduate engineering education. Are any of you involved in, in undergraduate education? I don't hear anyone. Tom, can I ask you to go, can you go back one slide? Yeah. <clears throat> so you all are gonna be working on midterms and finals coming up with principles. You might want to look carefully at this slide when you're design when you're doing your design. And Tom has shared his slides. I'll be posting them to Dropbox for everybody. So um, I just want to point out this this is like the tech variety model. This is very similar in nature, but it, it, there's a lot of differences as well. So it's another take on what's important in the design of effective learning environments. So thanks, Tom. Yeah. And if anybody has any questions along the way, don't hesitate to let us know and I will address it on the spot. Uh, so a number of years ago, uh, I got contacted by the uh, US Air Force Academy. Uh, they had a problem. Uh, they had uh, the Air Force Academy, like all the military academies are basically undergraduate engineering education universities, colleges, and uh, every student there gets basically an engineering degree in mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, uh, aerospace engineering, field engineering, et cetera. And uh, they take a multiple introductory courses. So they might take a course in uh, uh, field engineering or uh, electrical engineering or uh, aerospace engineering or either chemical engineering. And what they were finding is after these students took five introductory courses, they didn't think like engineers and they didn't think like designers. They may have gotten A's in all these courses, but they really didn't have the higher order outcomes that they really wanted the cadets to have. Uh, for example, if you're, if you're involved in engineering education, and any field will have these types of higher order outcomes, <clears throat> but you want people to think like engineers. You want them to really, you know, how do engineers think? They have uh, various principles and models and things that they apply, so they need to learn to think like engineers. Uh, they need to develop robust mental models related to their particular field of engineering. Uh, there are general mental models in engineering, but there are also specific mental models relevant to whether you're in electrical engineering or mechanical engineering or whatever it might be. Um, you want them to be committed to lifelong learning. Engineering, like most fields today, as a, you know, the half-life of what you learn in college is pretty brief. And so you want them to always be wanting to learn more, develop new skills, uh, new habits, and so forth. So they found that they, they weren't achieving these outcomes. So they asked us to come in and design a new course. And I actually uh, had one of my 
doctoral students, Mary Marlino, involved in this project. And they ended up hiring her later as the director of educational technology at the US Air Force Academy. And uh, she had a great career there. She met her husband there. <laughs> um, Why do uh, I know that name, Tom? It's the same, so she sounds familiar. Oh, you probably met Mary. At, uh, she keynoted at some of the conferences over the years. She later went on, she left the uh, Air Force Academy uh, after her uh, husband retired from the military and he became a professor of political science at the University of Colorado. And she um, became the uh, head of multiple projects at the University Consortium for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and uh, anyway, so we applied this model to the design of a new course, which was gonna be called just general introduction to engineering. Before they took any of the specific types of engineering, they would take this course. And so the authentic, uh, this was done at the Air Force Academy. Uh, and uh, have any of you ever visited the Air Force Academy? It's quite a unusual, beautiful, campus and uh, spent a lot of time out there. I actually had another doctoral student, Kevin Oliver, who's now a full professor at North Carolina State University. He spent a whole year out there uh, collecting data for this particular project. Um, but um, he loved the ski, so he wasn't uh, unhappy about that. <laughs> um, so, this new course had an authentic uh, context. The authentic context was the students actually became members of a Mars mission team. Uh, so the classes were split up into teams and the students were uh, working with each other, but they were also working with experts from NASA, experts from the Air Force and experts from other universities. <clears throat> And they had this ill-structured problem to solve. How do you get to Mars? There are actually three tasks. How do you get to Mars? How do you build a, a, a living facility on Mars? And how do you develop a renewable power source on Mars? So they had the authentic context and these real life tasks. By the way, these are ill-structured problems. Nobody knows how to get to Mars. Nobody knows how you could build a base on Mars or how to develop a power source. There are no right answers that you can find in a textbook or even talking to an expert. There's a lot of different possibilities. So during the semester, they, had, they spent the first third of the semester coming up with their solution of how do you get payloads to Mars? Second third of the semester they spent, how do you build a, a uh, living base on Mars, and the thir last third, they were developing a power source, you know, nuclear, solar, hybrid, whatever it would, would be. Um, <clears throat> they had access to expert performances. Like I said, they actually uh, had, they had access to people at NASA, at the Air Force, uh, Smithsonian, other uh, Air and Space Museum, and so forth. Um, so that was an important part of the learning environment. Uh, they played different roles at different times. Some of them were involved in communications, some in construction, some in research. So they did real things. The first third of the semester, they built model rockets and they flew those rockets and collected data and trying to come up with a model of how they would get a payload to Mars. Uh, the second third of the semester, they built 3D models of what their research would look like on Mars. What materials would they have to bring there? What materials could they use that were already on Mars in order to build a livable environment? And the last third, uh, they built a computer model of their power source, uh, whether it was hybrid or solar, nuclear, whatever it was. And uh, they worked in teams, uh, you know, they built rockets and so forth, um, built these physical 3D models of the site on Mars. And uh, they, it was a, a, so unlike other courses that they were in, 
uh, because most of the courses they were in were taught in very traditional ways, lectures and tests and term papers. Uh, they engaged in reflection uh, about the work. There were various assignments that had them engaging in different types of reflection, important part of learning. And then at the end of each third of the semester, they had them, each team had to make a formal presentation to the entire class, plus the faculty, um, about how they were going to solve these problems of how to get to Mars, how to live there, how to have a renewable power source. And so they would make presentations, uh, military style briefings is what they call them, um, about how their solutions were to the problem. And uh, <clears throat> they had, again, the faculty role was mainly as coaching and scaffolding and that, that sort of thing. Uh, there were some lectures, but they all were uh, voluntary. You didn't have to go to them, uh, but they brought in a number of experts to lecture about different topics. And then the assessment was so important. It had to be very, as authentic as possible. So as I mentioned, they did these military briefings on their solutions to the problems. They had peer and expert review. They built these real and computer-based artifacts. They kept learning diaries for reflection, formal staff meetings, br briefings, and participation in an online discussion forum as ways of ass assessing their learning. <clears throat> and in this course, we, we got some, uh, amazing results. And we actually uh, did uh, some quasi-experimental studies where we compared the mental models of cadets who were in the traditional introductory courses with the cadets in this new course. And so we found they had enhanced problem-solving skills. They had richer mental models of what it was to be an engineer. They had improved communication skills, enhanced research skills, better team skills, and more commitment to good work. And um, the good news is we ran this course out there for three years. We continue to get phenomenal results. And at, but the Air Force Academy is a rather strange environment because they only have 18 permanent faculty members. Everybody else is an Air Force officer that gets rotated in there for three years and then leaves, goes back to another type of assignment. So they have rotating faculty. And at the end of three years, the faculty who built and worked with us on this course left. And the new faculty didn't want to do it. <laughs> so they dropped the course after three years of great success. It was a real heartbreaker, but it was real demanding. I mean, they, well, so one of the things that cadets told us, you know, uh, you know, why aren't all our courses this way? This is a great course. We're learning so much, but I don't have time for all these tasks. And, and uh, I'm, you know, struggling with calculus and, and these other courses and so forth. So it was very time demanding on both the students and on the faculty. So that was probably another reason they, dropped the course after three years. So if we're gonna be involved in authentic learning, and I believe, and I can show you another study, didn't wanna to spend too much time on it tonight, but we can not just do this in you know face-to-face -face courses, we can do this online, we can do this blended, um, but you really wanna design environments that are based around authentic tasks, active learning, problem-based learning, or project-based learning. Um, that's what really makes a difference. <clears throat> Years ago, um, when the web first came along, and I would have faculty members come to us in our uh, department. Our department was called Instructional Technology at that time. It's later was changed to Learning Design and Technology. But the faculty members would come and say, well, I want to get a website for my course. And uh, I'd say, okay, well, we could probably help you with that. Tell me about your course. Oh, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of 
websites now related to my geology course and I can put all those in my syllabus. Uh, we'd say, well, yeah, well, we can help you with that, but tell me about your course. What do students do? And when we would drill down, we'd find out, okay, students are reading a textbook. They are going to lectures. They're taking tests and um, maybe writing a term paper, but all of the tasks that they were involved in were basically academic tasks rather than authentic tasks. And so we would say, okay, we can help you with your website, but let's talk about the task. What is it your students are going to do? And what is it they're going to learn? That's what it really boils down to when you're uh, designing a learning environment. So, um, you know, these, this kind of model can be applied in lots of areas, lots of contexts, not just STEM education, but also other areas. Two courses I wanna mention, uh, this is one that I actually helped with at the University of Canberra in Australia. So there was a professor there who was the foremost Australian expert on children's literature. And she had the idea of her students coming up with a prospectus for a children's book. And so she teamed up with a professor who taught illustration. And the, so the class was made up of teams, to, uh, pairs of students, one from ch who was studying children's literature, the other one who was studying illustration. And they actually, their major task in the course was to come up with a professional level proposal for a children's book. And then we had a show and tell on the final night of the course. And we had professional judges come in and Penguin Press agreed to publish the winning book. So imagine the motivation of these students. They're gonna get their first book published. Children's That's books. awesome. That's really cool. Hard <laughs> yet published. Yeah, it was awesome. And I was one of the jury, one of the judges for this uh, last night of the course. I spent a couple of months at the University of Canberra years after I was in Perth. And it was such a great course, but it was all built around the idea of the authentic course. Another professor, this was at the University of Queensland, uh, taught uh, film and literature, American film and literature criticism. And so what he did every semester was he had the students actually edit a professional journal of criticism of American literature and film. And so the students, again, would work in pairs to say, analyze a great film like Casablanca or a great book like To Kill a Mockingbird. And then public, they would, choose, edit, and choose the best ones would get published in a real journal. So again, that authentic task, that motivation. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to be just STEM education to apply these kinds of ideas. It can be all kinds of areas. And Tom, we might want to mention that Canberra is basically the Washington DC of Australia. It's yes, the capital. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's the capital area there. Um, like the District of Columbia, it's a it's not a state, it's a kind of a, like a territory. It's a territory, not far from Sydney, too far. Uh, and if you go there, it's not like a high security. You can get right in parliament and listen to prime minister questions and just walk right in. At least when I was there, you could park your car underneath it. And just like no one's, at least they weren't then. I'm sure they're checking much more now. This is 20 years yeah. ago. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, yeah. they've had some incidents there that they have probably have tightened up security quite a bit. But uh, and I'm yeah. surprised. I'm surprised that Penguin. I mean, that's a major publisher. Uh, so is it Penguin Australia or is it Penguin Worldwide that did this? It was Penguin Australia. Uh huh. It's amazing Which is big because they're part of the Commonwealth. And yeah. Penguin oh, okay. The UK. Right. <laughs> Did you get any names of editors? I love that for one of my books. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a But anyway, um, so 
authentic learning requires pedagogical change. Uh, that's one of the reasons we can't, we actually, my wife and I put money down on a continuing care retirement community in Boulder, Colorado. That was near the University of Colorado. Uh, we were thinking of moving out there and then we came back to Barry College to look at this place again because it was just beginning to open. It opened in June of 2020. And we were so impressed by uh, all of the students at Barry have to have a job. They have to work in some way. And so they have a lot of enterprises. Um, like this is the Barry farm. Students run a dairy farm and a, a beef cattle farm. Um, in fact, I went on a four and a half mile hike this morning through the uh, cattle farm area. Um, and uh, a couple Saturdays ago, we had all the students come over with their various enterprises and uh, they were selling things, you know, selling cheese, selling beef, selling um, furniture, uh, soap, uh, clothing uh, items and so forth. They're very, they're learning entrepreneurial skills while they're in college. So many of their courses are built around authentic tasks. And that was one of the reasons we decided to come here. So uh, here's uh, information about uh, Christiane. Uh, she has her own company called redesigneducation.com. She left the University of Minnesota because she wants to go back to Europe, um, to Germany uh, for family reasons primarily. But, uh, and then my own contact information. I know Christiane would have loved to be here tonight. You know, I, I first um, met Christiane when I was doing a talk about design-based research in her class at the University of Minnesota uh, over Zoom. And she asked some really great questions. We started uh, uh, talking uh, through email and so forth. And then I, I've been involved for the last uh, eight years in prison education. And I was helping to run a, uh, organize a fun run in um, St. Paul, Minnesota to uh, raise awareness of what we call the second prison project. Basically when people come out of prison, they are put almost put in a second prison. They can't get housing, they can't vote, they uh, can't get jobs. It's really an awful, awful situation. So we organized this fun run and I had mentioned it in the class and uh, Christy Ann came out and ran in the race. And uh, so then uh, the other organizers and I took her to uh, and some other doctoral students who came and helped us from the University of Minnesota took them all out to lunch. And that's how this all started. So that's all I was going to say tonight uh, because I wanted to deal with your questions yeah. and so forth. There are questions in the jam board, but before we get to that, you mentioned that you have some slides about online learning that you have didn't, didn't show us tonight. Can you include them in the so I could at least share those slides with them and-, and um, Sure, absolutely. In fact, I could show a few just of show them. A couple, yeah, just show a few of them, then we'll go to questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, by the way, I'll show you this. So this is a map of Australia. And every place you see a smiley face is where I have, uh, worked wow either given i've been down there about 14 times and stayed as long as five months at a time wow and, uh given keynotes or done workshops or i've written three books with australians um so yeah it's uh it's kind of like a second home uh and we really really love it um so let's see yeah, let me, this was uh, part of a keynote I gave in, in uh, Turkey in um, May. Okay, here we go. So, um, 
for quite a few years, I worked as a consultant for the World Health Organization and um, worked with the, uh, the guys on either end are Turkish MDs. Um, and the guy next to me is uh, Jim Vesper, who was one of my PhD students. In fact, Jan Harrington and I super co-supervised his PhD and his dissertation won the dissertation of the year from ATD, the Association for Talent Development, it used to be called ASTD. So this little part is basically about his dissertation. So uh, the group that I work with are in charge of uh, vaccines in developing countries. It's uh, called the Vaccine Quality Network of the World Health Organization. And there's a major problem with vaccines in that they have to be kept in at certain temperatures. In fact, just last week, my wife was going to Walgreens to get her latest bivalent uh, shot. And uh, just about an hour before she was supposed to get the shot, she got a text saying, don't come, the batch is thawed out and it's ruined and you have to come tomorrow. So most vaccines and particularly the, some of the uh, COVID vaccines uh, have a very narrow temperature range they have to be kept in. So it's a big problem as you might imagine in developing countries where you have unreliable power sources and other issues. So for years, the World Health Organization would address this problem by inviting 15 people involved in managing the cold chain in developing countries to Turkey, which had a really good system for this, and putting them on a bus and driving them for a week to see the cold chain and how it worked in Turkey. I actually went on this bus course and we traveled, the one I went on, traveled from Izmir down to Antalya and we visited a vaccine warehouse, a university hospital, provincial vaccine stores, family health centers, um, retail pharmacies and so forth along the, the week long bus course. And they were involved in a lot of authentic tasks but I casually mentioned they could only take 15 people a year. And I said, um, you know, we could put this course online. I said this to Uma Kartugla at the World Health Organization. He said, what? We can't put this course online. This is a bus. <laughs> Authentic learning. I said, yeah, but I think we could put it online. Anyway, we got some grants from the Gates Foundation and other groups. And we did indeed put the course online. We used the authentic learning model that's in uh, the book Jan and Ron and I did, this model I showed earlier. And we also, uh, Jim, for his dissertation, applied the same research model that uh, Christiane used uh, from our book. <clears throat> so in the model, you go through a phase of analysis and exploration. And we met all over the world. We meet in Geneva, we meet in Turkey, we meet in Georgia. Uh, and uh, trying to figure out, you know, how could we build this online course? We go through a phase of design and construction of the course and um, eventually uh, tested and refined the course. For example, the first uh, design of the homepage of the course was on the left there. Looks cute and clever, but it turned out that the professionals who would take this course, who are public health inspectors, physicians, pharmacists, et cetera, they didn't like it. So the final course is like on the right and uh, it's much more abstract, but they found it to be more uh, effective for them. And then the course would meet online. Uh, there's my doctoral student, Jim and Umit, who taught the first version of the course and we had students from all over the world involved in this. Um, and they did real things in the course. They actually uh, toured sites and looked for problems in the sites, things that were, things might get thawed out prematurely and stuff like that, how keeping inventory, all those kinds of things. So, uh, and, uh, the course ended up winning all kinds of awards, design awards, and Jim got his dissertation. I didn't go back, get to go back to Perth for his, uh, when he got his uh, 
degree, but uh, there's Jan Harrington with him when he graduated. And as I mentioned, he won the uh, dissertation of the year. But uh, that was a really exciting uh, project. And uh, the learners who have been in this course just were, they, they said, oh my gosh, we've never learned this way before. This is not online learning, this is real learning. Uh, and uh, they said it was, they felt like they were there on the bus. And so they got really, really good results. So that was that one. Yep. So that's that's great. That just adds a little flavor for what you spoke on earlier. Both are great examples for, for everyone who's here today, as well as those who will watch the recording later. Um, and you can send Dr. Reeves an email if you have questions. His email is in the bio I sent to all of you, or I think it is. We have three questions or four the last time I looked in the Jamboard. We also have Dodsey putting a question in the chat. Now we've got one, two, six, uh, six questions now in the Jamboard. And we should probably go to that first before we go to the questions in the chat. Uh, Bell, did you have a question in the Jamboard? We'll start with you, Bell. Uh, no, I didn't put in question. Okay. So who's who would like to jump in and, and get the first question from the Jamboard? Um, Tiana, do you have a question in the jam board? We'll go ladies first tonight. Oh, no, I haven't put one in the jam board. Okay. Uh, how about Sunmei? Bo raised his hand. <laughs> Is that ladies first then? No, so yeah, hey, yeah. I'll put it down there. Sunmei? Oh, I don't have any questions. Okay. That's because already a lot of questions, so I can <laughs> join. Okay. Okay. So let's go to Bo. Bo, Bo knows, Bo knows the commercial. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wanting to know, uh, Dr. Reeves or Professor Reeves, um, when you were going through the, um, talking about the, the project that you guys did with the, the cadets of the Air Force, um, you mentioned that you, uh, that you guys were, uh, um, were able to assess them uh, towards the end of the course um, and kind of compare the, their growth and in, in the skills that they developed to that of the, the cadets that were in the traditional course as well. Did, did you um, do any type of pre-assessment as well to kind of determine whether that, that growth was actually due in part to the course itself or something that was already uh, pre-established in, uh, in those individuals? Yeah, that, thank you, Bo. The, um, we absolutely did. Um, and um, so we used King and Kitchener's metal uh, model of uh, uh, solving ill-structured problems. And they are very well known in the literature and they've actually developed a, a set of assessments for solving ill-structured problems. So as a pretest, we would give them problems like um, you, uh, you have to fly uh, 24 sorties today um, and you have this many aircraft, you have this many pilots, you know, a whole lot of variables. And then they uh, would be given 15 minutes to come up with their solution to how they, you know, how they were gonna organize those flights. Uh, maybe it was 30 minutes, something like that. But anyway, uh, then they, their solutions would be taken away from them and they would be given a set of questions that would ask them things like, if you could have had one more piece of information, uh, what would that have been? Uh, and so forth to kind of debrief their problem solving. And then those solutions and their answers to those questions are judged by people who are professionally trained to look for uh, problem solving abilities. And what we found across all the courses, the experimental courses and the control courses, pretest was everyone was at a deficient problem solving level. And at the end of the course, we found that the people in the control courses that were mechanical engineering still were at the deficient levels, whereas the people in the uh, Mars course, um, had, they were sufficient to expert problem solving, a whole standard deviation shift wow. in their ability to do problem solving. Now, you might say, well, Tom, of course. I mean, they spent the whole semester solving those structured problems. But that was the point. The pedagogy matched the outcomes that we were looking for. And so we got really good results. It was published in the literature and so forth. It was just such a heartbreaker that after three years, 
they said, you know, this is a great course, but that workload is just way too much. Can, can I ask a follow up on that real quick? Sure. Okay. Um, just with what you said, so uh, the the um, increase in in their problem solving capabilities throughout the course of that semester, did that expand into other areas, or was it specific to the content in that course itself? Um, I'm just trying to think because that's a huge uh, jump that 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 their skills uh, move forward. And if that's the case, you know, I mean, you'd want that to continue in other areas also. Yes, and we did find we followed the cadets that were in that first course, and they were freshmen, and um, we found that they retained a lot of that over the next two years. We also that first year gave the same assessments. We had pretty good funding on this. We gave the same assessments to all of the graduating seniors. And we found that they had deficient problem solving, at least as measured by King and Kitchener's measure. So here they were, hmm. you know, graduating with 3.69 grade point averages or whatever, but they still didn't think like engineers. They didn't know how to uh, attack ill structure problems. They were expert at solving textbook problems, but these ill structure problems really they struggled with. And, uh, but yeah, we did follow up. I would love to have gone even uh, further on that, but we weren't able to. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. By the way, Kurt, you knew I, I brought Jim Laffey in on that project too. He and I, uh, Jim was a guy that I used to work with at Apple and then he retired from Apple and started teaching at the University of Missouri. Missouri. Yeah. Did he pass away? Pardon? Did he pass away? Oh, no, no. He's living. <laughs> Hardly. He's uh, retired in Pagosa Springs, Colorado. He skis, he golfs, he lives the good life. <laughs> yeah. I think I heard, I, I, what I didn't realize is that you knew my GPA. Um, but anyways, you guessed it. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, actually. Um, uh, so Ga uh, normally has deep questions. I was holding off on his until the end when... Uh, that wasn't the God. Do you ha have something on the jam board? Uh, hi, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. It's pretty loud here. Um, I don't have a question on the jam board, but they did post on the chat. So, the base of the question is I work with people who are very innovative and they would go out their ways to design a course like Mars mission course. And then there are people also in the school like me who can say, Hey, where's the return on investment? Three years we're spending like half a million dollars. Doesn't make sense. So my question is, how do we make that course sustainable? I mean, it's part of years. If we have to uh, redefine the course again, how do I convince my boss that it's worth a half million dollars? How can you just? I guess how can you justify the cost that's being spent now? He's in our Kelly School of Business, which is ranked really high on top ten and whatnot. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, so. Yeah, and I wish I could tell you that this was the only time this happened to me, but it wasn't. Uh, another time I had a grant with a professor in geography to redesign uh, some courses, and we had uh, a whole lot of real-world tasks involving early versions of the uh, uh, navigation systems, handheld navigation systems, and so forth. <clears throat> but... Um, that course also ran for three years, the, uh, the length of the grant, and then went away because it was not sustainable. So that's always been a problem. So many innovations are created with funding, and then when that funding goes away. So you, you almost have to have an institutional commitment to when you bring in a grant like this and you do really innovative things that they're going to sustain that over time. And that's really difficult, uh, particularly in today's uh, climate to, uh, to do that. Um, I've been working during the pandemic was in medical education. My first job after I finished my PhD in 1979, I went to Peru for a year as a Fulbright. When I came back, I got hired at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston and I was a director of assessment and evaluation there because my PhD is actually in evaluation of research methods. And I um, um, 
have retained an interest in medical education ever since. I went to the University of Georgia in 1982, primarily because uh, my son was living in Atlanta with his mother and stepfather, and I wanted to be closer to him and ended up spending my whole career at Georgia. I loved it, but um, it, um, I always retained an interest in medical education. So I, when the pandemic started, I was working with some folks um, at the Baylor College of Medicine. In fact, Kurt and I traveled to Houston just before the pandemic really got out of control. And we were there on Valentine's of 2020. And um, they had a medical education conference that Baylor was involved in. And then once the pandemic shut all education down, one of the big problems was in medical education, you had to have a lot, lot of clinical learning environments. And how do you have clinical environments when you can't be near other humans? So we designed a course literally on the fly for the first year medical students that semester where they met online and they were in teams, five person teams plus a physician, a faculty member who was also an MD. And their task was to come up with designs for how would you provide experiential learning online? And they spent the entire course coming up with prototypes. And at the end of the course, we had a shark tank, tank type event where they pitched their ideas to a group of experts and so forth. So we jumped into the breach and, and the course was really successful. Um, so many uh, medical schools and all kinds of colleges just tried to slap traditional education onto the web and, and it wasn't very successful, uh, particularly so, so you, in the early months of the pandemic. Speaking of Shark Tank, you know that Mark Cuban's a grad of our business school. Um, oh, is that right? I did not know that. Uh, yeah. He's an interesting person. Yeah, along with Larry Ellison from Oracle. Uh, so yeah, a lot of a lot of folks. Yeah. So um, we need to go to Dodsey and Christian because they must have seven questions apiece uh, as I look at the jam board. So why don't you pull your best question up here, Dodsey, and and uh, propose it to Tom, then we'll go to Christian last. Dodsey, you're muted. And yeah, that, okay, sorry, I was, I was having my dinner. That's the reason why I didn't. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Dazi's in Ottawa working for the Premier Justin Trudeau. Um, oh. And so, yeah. Yes, we, we met before. I, I saw Professor Professor Reef the first time in Hawaii in 2009. Yeah. And I attended one of your, your lecture, your lectures here. Uh, a few months ago, and you were talking about going to the minor seminary in in uh, Pennsylvania, and you shared yeah. a good story about that that day. Okay, oh, my question is about uh, um, uh, opposing uh, academic tasks and um, authentic tasks, actually. So instead of opposing them, can we just say that both are uh, elements of uh, a good continuum where um, authentic tasks come to complement a complete academic task. That's my question. Yeah, I, you don't, we definitely don't want to uh, throw out uh, all the existing pedagogical designs and just put everything into authentic tasks. Um, otherwise, it would just become one big vocational program. So there are a, there's worth certainly to a, a academic tasks for sure. We will, you know, you, uh, I went to a session the other day. Good to see you. I hope you had a nice dinner. <laughs> the uh, um, the a session the other day run by ACT about uh, project at. BYU, where they're producing open uh, textbooks for uh, various uh, educational technology courses. Phenomenal work. Uh, Rick West, one of our former doctoral students and a number of other professors at BYU are involved in this and, and students. 
Uh, and so, yeah, readings are important. Uh, there are good lectures and that's important. There are, it, sometimes you need to write a paper. Now, maybe instead of writing a, a paper about business plans, you could actually design a business plan. Um, and so I would promote the idea of making tasks as authentic as possible, but there has to be a blend between the academic and the authentic for sure. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you. So we end with Christian and you probably have six questions. How about you narrow it down to two or three and then we'll call it that, that'll be it for tonight. Christian? Um, so I'll start with maybe one that's not so esoteric. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you esoteric, come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I have to say these questions are not as good as the, the previous ones that you've just been asked. So we'll, we'll just put it there. <laughs> um, <laughs> So in your discussion about the, um, the pr project you did in Turkey where you were building a course to help um, people understand um, vaccination transportation, um, was, you, you talked about meeting in person. Um, was that physicality key to the, the success of that project? Well, the, uh, they met in person on the bus course where they actually traveled together and uh, worked in three person teams to come up with ways of redesigning the cold chain management for their particular countries, whether it was Indonesia or Brazil or whatever. But on the online course, it was totally online. There were no face-to-face uh, -face meetings in that. They just met online. And uh, we, um, so we might have a learner in Russia working with a learner in Ghana, working with a learner in uh, Chile, uh, and uh, one of the things we found out, it seems we like we should have known this, but we had to put people within four or five time zones of each other because otherwise it became very difficult to get them to work, collaborate together. But um, yeah, that those courses were totally online. And, and actually that model has now been used to develop other courses for the WHO. For example, look, there's a course they used our model to teach people how to do, uh, to manage clinical trials uh, in uh, uh, developing countries where a lot of clinical trials are done actually. And so um, maybe not like the participants in the course, but during the development process when you were- Oh, uh, during the development, your I see, yeah. Yeah, during the, yeah we, um, I think so because uh, there were two things going on. We were designing this new course, but at the same time, Jim was doing his PhD and collecting all this data. So he was interviewing and observing and uh, all of that was going on. So yeah, sometimes we met uh, you know, online, but most of the time we did, uh, we met in <laughs> various places. One time we met in, uh, uh, we met mostly in, in Turkey, but we met in Geneva. We met here in Georgia. I rented a lake house and everybody came from Geneva, London, Turkey. Uh, and uh, another time we met at uh, Jim's house uh, in Provincetown uh, in Cape Cod. <laughs> and uh, Fabulous. We were, we were, it was really <laughs> nice and, and everything, but... I was flying out of there to Boston on a little tiny plane. What was that airline called? May or something. Anyway, little tiny plane, like seven passengers. And they, the uh, pilot was concerned about the weather. And so he was, he's, he had to bump one of the passengers. And I'm thinking, oh, he's going to bump me. And I didn't know whether, I, do I want to be bumped because the weather's really crappy? <laughs> or do I want to catch my flight in Boston. I ended up staying on the flight and got on my flight in Boston. But that was a, a very <laughs> weird flight, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, it's, that airline is, is called YKE, White Knuckle Express. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's called Cape Airline. It's called Cape Airline. Cape Air, yeah. yeah. One of my friends actually flies with them. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so happened to me another time, in, uh, I was in uh, Bulgaria, and uh, we were flying from Sofia to Varna, and they, uh, 
in at this time, this was quite some time ago, but they had no cues. They just opened the doors and everybody ran to get on the plane. And I'm like this stupid American. I'm not running. I, I didn't know what was going on. They got on the plane. Finally, I got on there and I got a seat. And then the pilot came down and he was concerned about the weight of the plane. So he's kicking all these people off. And I'm like, please let me stay on the plane. Uh, and I did. I stayed on that time too. So we should probably go back to opening up to a female, uh, Sune or Bell. Did you have a question that's used, that you came up with during the other question and, and answer? Anything you want to pose before Dr. Reeves goes? If not, we'll go to Christian for the last question. Christian. Um, so the last question, unless Bell, if you wanted to chime in, do you have anything? <laughs> No, oh, maybe. Yeah. I wonder, do you have any example of the authentic learning in a community of practice? I'm sorry, I didn't understand uh, the question. Do you have any example of like using authentic learning in a community of practice? Oh, in a community of practice. Uh, well, um, in many of the uh, online or blended courses, we do try to have students build a community within the course. And so one of the first things we always do is we, um, the first week we have a whole series of icebreakers and uh, exercises to kind of build teamwork um, because particularly in the World Health Organization courses we're our students are professionals. So they're physicians, they're pharmacists, they're public health inspectors, they're experts already, but most of them don't speak English as a, as a first language. And so they have varying degrees of English skills and um, they've never worked in teams online. And so we have to nurture that. So we try to build a community uh, through a number of different things. And, and the teachers who, uh, teachers, again, they're physicians and so forth, but who lead these courses, they work really hard because they have weekly face-to-face uh, -face sessions with each team. They uh, turn, they have a guarantee of turning around written work within uh, 24 hours. So, you know, if a team comes up with, say, their uh, oh, in the 12-week the online course, the f last five weeks of the course, each team is giving a, given a real-world client. So it might be somebody in the Ministry of Edu uh, Public Health in Romania, and they're struggling with the cold chain for vaccines, and they give this team a real-world problem, and they uh, have to solve that. But so we really stress community building within the courses. I have a question just to, as your former engineering students, always actually I studied with over 100 students in one you know, classroom. So for example, so all students, over 100 students to take an online class, how do you, you know, make them engage in the course? So for example, intro course, actually, or kind of engineering students take the same course. So usually we divide it into three classes, but even, you know, over 100 class. So it's really hard to say hello to, you know, my neighbor student something. Yeah. So what do yeah. you think about? Yeah. Really well, at the Air Force Academy, they don't have any large lecture courses. So uh, courses have a maximum, I think, of 24 students, something like that. So we never really face that problem. And uh, the teams were usually uh, three or four people on a team, and they would have a faculty mentor. So we didn't really have that issue, but I can see where that would be a big challenge when you get those kinds of numbers. Maybe I, I was an older student, so maybe nowadays a smaller classroom, I hope. But, yeah, you know, yeah, where was that? Where were you doing that? Actually in South Korea, actually I studied okay. electronic engineering. So okay. at that time, you know, even I, 
recognize, you know, I don't, I didn't recognize that students with my classroom. That's because yeah. there are too many students. What, so what university, what university, Sunmi? Hogang University in Sinchun, near Iwa University. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Tom's been to Iwa. I've been to Iwa. Yeah. Uh, Always uh, I yeah, walk to Iwa. That's because uh, my school is a neighbor. Yeah. Oh, it's pretty close. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yonsei, Iwa, and Seogang is a three oh. university in Sinchun. <laughs> oh. And so she's in Silicon Valley working for Paul Kim, and she helped Paul Kim create the SMILE program. Yeah, so, you mentioned that the other yeah, night. Yeah, That's fantastic. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm a big fan of Paul Kim. He, uh, Quite an amazing gentleman. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So Christian, we're gonna have you send Tom your question because we're gonna wrap it up for tonight. We've gone for a while. Well, what was your last question? Just so we know we get it on the recording. So last question, uh, do you view the Summerhill project in the UK as a form of authentic learning? Yes, I do. A.S. Neal uh, was one of my heroes. So I read that book I came out of the army in 1971 and uh, started college and I was studying to be a uh, elementary school teacher and that was one of the books I read that and the pedagogy of the oppressed and those two books had an enormous influence on me still do uh, yes I thought, uh, I thought maybe <laughs> yeah, yeah that, uh, <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful work. Uh, I'd love to go back and see what happened to all those kids that went to that school. Yes, yeah. it's, it's been fascinating, Tom. I really appreciate you coming back the second week in a row for one of my classes. Tell Trisha that unfortunately I don't have the money to to send a check down there, but that I will you know reciprocate if she ever teaches a class for Georgia or somewhere else and she needs someone to come in uh, and say hello and whatever I can do for her and do for you. Um, and so we need to give Tom a big round of applause here tonight and, and send him emails if you have more questions because, you know, he's just hanging out in Rome. That's Rome, right. Rome, Georgia. I moved from <laughs> Athens to Rome. <laughs> you know, here in Indiana, we have the same thing. A lot of European uh, cities uh, named after. So yeah, all yeah. across up and down the state. You see different uh, places, just like Rome and Athens. Anyway, so I'm going to Milan sometime. <laughs> so, is it what? I said we'll take them to Milan sometime. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I'm going to stop the recording for a week. Right.